So yeah, thank you for the <laughs> for the presentations and very exciting uh, news about the isogenic uh, lines that you've been preparing. So I was thinking, have you considered the possibility? Is there actual possibility of like having them uh, conditionally repaired so you can like probe at which stage of the differentiation of uh, does PAC six up or down regulation might uh, affect the outcome? And the second question, uh, specific to those lines, regardless of the uh, conditional uh, f uh, repair of PAC 6 is this actually a valid uh, uh, graft uh, candidate to be like same donor PAC 6 repaired uh, stem cell graft? Is this on? Um, well, the conditional uh, PAC 6 correction. I think it could be done because uh, in other diseases, you can do a lot with CRISPR. You can just do a point mutation uh, like we are doing now, where we just immediately correct the mutation, right? And in these cases, it's really a single point change. Uh, you can do knock-in, so you can really introduce a whole new sequence of the gene. You can tag it to all, but this is a bit beyond my experience, so we actually we are working with a stem cell facility at Harbaud UMC who provide this as a service and we've been working with them because they really have the knowledge and the t expertise and the equipment to do this. So I'm learning a lot about that, but I'm, I couldn't, I think it could be possible, but not by me, very honestly. <laughs> at least not uh, without putting everything else. Do you say you may the question like in the future of pursuing such an approach? Yes, I guess, to, to really understand how, for example, because we know PAC-6 is do dosage related, if we could knock in in a way that we have different uh, concentrations of PAC-6, different doses, maybe we could understand exactly how these dosage mechanisms work, perhaps. Um, in our case, it's because we really want it as a, a real exact control, exact match control to our line so that we understand whatever differentiation outcome we have, is, is it because of the PAC-6 or is it because the line is behaving differently? We work with IPS, we know like sometimes they differentiate very well, the two weeks later they don't at all, So and we don't know why. And at least controlling that, for now at least, is our main goal. Um, and for the second, as a therapy. Yeah, it would be very interesting. There, there, it has been done for other genetic diseases that you d you use CRISPR as a gene editing therapy approach. So yeah, it could. It definitely has that potential. But again, um, we are more basic uh, research at the moment, at least. Maybe, Maybe who knows? We already have so many collaboration between us. Yeah. Another one wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just a short comment. Yeah, that is true. Um, also, the regulators are now mo much more open to genetically modifying these cells, of course, um, then um, using autologous cells that then would then be genetically modified. I mean, it's going to be super expensive, but the technology is advancing in such a speed that why not? Thank you. Tom. Thank you so much. Uh, great talks. Uh, a question to Scotman Lab. Uh, what do you uh, consider to be the most important uh, success factors for limbal stem cell transplantations or stem cell transplantations onto the ocular surface as of 2024. <laughs> <laughs> or you can say, uh, during the lunch, I will go in, <laughs> in depth. Okay. <laughs> Just yeah, briefly. that's or a bad one. Um, oh, sorry for that. I very fond of your work. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now I have the chance. <laughs> what yeah. would I consider the coolest thing we have at the moment? Is that what you mean? <laughs> yes, let's say so. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, one thing that's very important is that now we uh, we have a lot of, for example, clinical trials using uh, these cells for these, uh, like there's a lot of done work done with iPS cells, for example. So that kind of opens the bath for uh, all of us. So nobody's seen really, for example, <laughs> potent the, the safety issues. So that was a big thing in the field. Uh, is it safe to use iPS cells? And, and with all these um, trials on, that have been ongoing, actually the, I was the first one doing that. 
um, have shown no concerns in that, in that area. So, so I've seen, like even within the last couple of years, I've seen a big shift in, in how the regulatory authors, for example, react to these products and, and like using IPS cells and, and even genetically modi modifying them. So I, I think that's one of the sort of key factors that will lead us to success one day. <laughs> so thank you all. They were very comprehensive presentations. Um, I guess I have a couple of uh, quick questions. So one, uh, so I've, I've, it seems to me that you know Barrett has presented you know um, immunohistochemical evidence that these cells in aniridia patients may kind of be more similar to fetal you know phenotype rather than you know normal cells and on. Um, Dulce presentation, I saw that, you know, the gene ontology, you show that they had enriched pathways for, you know, DNA um, replication, cell migration or proliferation, so which, which I guess are enriched in, you know, fetal uh, uh, development. So do you, do you think that these things go together and, you know, perhaps we should think of aniridia corneas as, you know, more fetal phenotype uh, rather than adult one? Perhaps, yeah. Um, but I also think there's some sort of arrest in this process with aniridia. So they, they, because at day 15 or at the middle time point, we don't see, we see some things that I didn't go into it, but we at the epithelial signature of these cells, we don't see any changes with the control. So it does feel like it's something, uh, they, they are okay up to a point and then they start to change. Of course, okay. the this RNA seq is a bit biased towards the differences, right? So we're really only looking at how different they are. And for example, Tanya's showed that they do are able to differentiate to a point. So yeah, there's changes, but what they mean exactly for the cells in the tissue that that's still a bit unclear, it at least to me. Yeah, which kind of bring me to my my second comment, which was like, yes, I think. From a clinical perspective, we shouldn't forget that these cells are immersed in an environment, which is so important. I mean, we, we, we just reviewed that and the, the role of, you know, micro environment in, in where you, it's like the pot where you put your seed. So it, it can make the whole difference. So I think yeah. that something. That's also why I'm really uh, happy to be able to do the corneal organoids, mm -hmm. because in there you, at least the papers that have, pu have been published in this, which are not a lot, but they really show that there's different layers. And I'm really interested in, in finding out how the stroma connects, which is also part of your work, connects to the epithelium and how it supports. And maybe perhaps finding some changes or some early molecular changes in the stroma or in another layer can actually help save the epithelium later on. So that's also, that's what I'm very keen on. And the organoids are definitely a, a more complex and representative model for sure. Thank you. Is it possible for me to ask you when you're here? <laughs> I'm uh, thinking about everyone has so very good presentations about uh, building these cells uh, that we should put into the patient. Uh, is anyone walk? You you took my question there. Uh, is anyone? And uh, that's good. I guess you're a clinician also. Has anyone done work with? the milieu where you're putting these cells. Because when we see that, okay, we did do this and we do that, and when we have your fantastic cells, we still have the same patient. Mm -hmm. And uh, has, have you done any work so that we will not have to give them this very heavy immune therapy? Because they are young, you preferably you should give them this therapy when they are young and they want to get children themselves, they can't take this heavy immunotherapy. What, what shall we do with the milieu where we put your fantastic cells? Do you want to answer that? Yeah. I guess that's right. Yeah, that's true. And that's something that I think maybe one of the reasons that we see, see this success for a few years and then we kind of again lose the cells because the niche is kind of yeah, in a rough shape. Uh, uh, Shay Conan has done some work with, for example, collagenase, where he kind of prepares the limbal area uh, that would hopefully then be more sort of um, 
well, the structure would be more beneficial for the cells to actually integrate and, and stay there and, and keep uh, their stemness. So that's one thing, and that's something we, we definitely need to consider and, and do more work on. Um, then about the immunosuppression, what we're kind of hoping to do with the induced pupitin stem cells is to genetically modify them so that um, um, I think uh, there's a big chance that we need to give the patients immunosuppression initially because all the barriers are gone. Like the situation in the eye when we do it, the transplantation is pretty rough. But once that's healed, so maybe with these cells that have been HLA modified, for example, we can then like gradually take them off the immunosuppression. So that's kind of my hope that with induced pupit and stem cells, we could do that. Sorry. Yeah, I just want to make a, a comment, do two comments actually now from this. I think that was a great uh, comment, Barrett, that you made. But I'm going to turn it around and say, what are you doing? I mean, not, maybe not specifically you, but clinicians, what are you doing to prepare the environment uh, for transplantation, for new cells, for stem cells? Are you taking into account uh, that there are anti-angiogenic drugs, that there are pro- uh, neurotrophic drugs, um, that there are, are medical ways, I mean we've heard about the surgical ways, but there are also medical ways to treat the cornea, to prepare the cornea. Are we thinking about these uh, as well? Because I think absolutely the niche, niche environment is, is, is critical. Uh, so that was one point. And then the second point is, I think, to re reiterate um, Julio's comment, I think Barrett showed very nicely in the tissue sections that perhaps the limbal stem cells lo are looking, or that environment is looking like um, the embryonic environment. And then Dulce said, okay, yeah, some of these cells that they were differentiating, they start to, they're somewhere trapped in that, in that transition from uh, you know, the early phase to, to the fully differentiated phase. So this could be really interesting to, to th maybe think about the limbal stem cell and the limbal stem cell deficiency as maybe, and there's evidence that the limbal stem cells are probably still there in aniridia uh, corneas, but could it be just that they're just not able, because of the Pax 6 mutation, they're not able to fully uh, develop, fully differentiate. So could, should we see this maybe more like a uh, undifferentiated uh, limbal stem cell sort of deficiency, and maybe we should focus on trying to find ways to um, promote the differentiation uh, of those cells um, early in life. So I just wanted to make that comment. Can I just uh, try to address uh, your comment? I mean, obviously, one of the critical things that we have to do before transplantation is control information. I mean, this is absolutely critical, and we, we work hard to achieve that. I mean, what Tanja mentioned about the check on work, I mean, this is some work we've been doing together, is a little bit focus on chemical burn, because chemical burn, the limb is stiff, mm. all right? And the collagenase idea yeah, is to... True coming from the clinical side is exactly try to soften the tissue to see if these stimulate stamina and less differentiation, right? And then, I mean, uh, again, the, the neurotroph component, you know, something that we are looking at, and then if we need to do some work on that because absolute from, for example, from the chemical burn, you know, there is even after three years of limb stem cell transplantation, the nerve regeneration is zero. It doesn't change anything at all. That's something I think is critical. The other aspect is like, for example, we published a paper recently. If you look at the inflammation post-transplantation, the inflammation at time of transplantation is really down because we treat them preoperatively. But then at one year post-op, the, the inflammation starts coming back on tears again. I mean, our interpretation is potentially that we have reduced the steroid treatment at that stage, thinking that everything is going well, and then the inflammation is coming back. But the neurotroph component could play around a game, a, a very important role on stimulate information, bring the information back because the neurotroph component never disappeared. Then there are lots of things that we need to do, no yeah, doubt and, about and that. it doesn't really make sense just to like stick cells there yeah. and hope that they are doing Absolutely. something. Yeah. We need something more. Yeah. We are aware of it, yeah. you know, um, and obviously it works. I mean, we are we're going to publish a paper very soon of our cases, you know, up to three years post-transplantation, limb stem cell transplant, but these are all autologous. Mm. Then again, you, if you think about allogeneic or IPS, whatever, then you have to think differently. You know, there's a lot of things to look at. I'm sorry, the kitchen has called yeah. and said the <laughs> food is uh, warm and ready. Okay. But we have just one last comment because you had a, uh, uh, so I'll, I'll give you the mic. But then let's, after that, let's uh, just move down directly to, to have lunch. Thank you. Many thanks for this uh, opportunity. Great talks in, all in total. Very nice. Uh, I addressed it the, the same direction. Did you look in your data, uh, Duke and, and, and uh, Barrett, and 
on the pro-inflammatory markers in the um, RNA-seq or also in your tissues that you find more immune cells or what kind of immune cells or especially in the aniridia stem cells that you see an increase of pro-inflammatory markers? I can't recall with certain. I think there was one of the pathways, because we can also look at the pathways, uh, specific pathways, and I think, I w I think there was something pro-inflammatory, but I can, I can recheck that and then maybe answer you in a couple of days, because I don't want to say anything wrong. But I, I have the feeling that there was something. But inflammation was never, yeah. We, we do focus more on the epithelial identity and commitment, so we, we kind mm. of directed all our eyes to that. But it's definitely a valid point, and especially hearing about the inflammation issues. I can, I can certainly go back to the data and look at it. Yeah.